I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is for my professional responsibility class. Here, I'm going to be talking about ABA Model Rule 1.15, which addresses how lawyers should handle client funds and property that's been entrusted to their care. So having said that, let's dive in. Part A says, and this is the most important part of the rule, I think, a lawyer shall hold property of clients or third persons uh, that is in the lawyer's possession in connection with the representation separate from the lawyer's own property. This means that you can't commingle funds. So if a client uh, gives you uh, funds to use for the representation, or let's say you are handling a real estate closing and you represent the buyer, so they can give you the funds to pass to the, um, to the seller of the property or whatever it is that's being sold, uh, you can't put those in your own bank account or uh, your own funds or your firm's operating expenses. You have to have a separate account for client funds. That's the big takeaway from this rule. But there's some specifics to keep in mind. The funds have to be kept in a separate account in the state where the lawyer's office is situated. So keep in mind, if you have offices in a number of states at your firm, the one where you work is in theory where the uh, where your office is and where the client comes and meets with you is where the bank account should also be located. Also keep in mind that even though there are federal regulations about banks, banks are also regulated uh, to some extent on a state by state level or elsewhere with the consent of a client or third person. Now watch out for this on the MPRE. Uh, this isn't a heavily tested subject on the MPRE, but you will have at least two questions about it, I think, and maybe three. And the, sometimes you could be asked something where the lawyer puts the funds in an account in another state. Maybe he has two, uh, two offices and pay close attention to whether the client consented to that. If the client consents, it's okay. If not, it's not okay. So let's go back to our rule. Other property shall be identified as such and appropriately safeguarded. So they give the example in the comments that securities should be kept in a bank uh, safe deposit box, like as pictured here, if you haven't seen these before. Um, other property should be similarly secure. So if the client gives you um, property that wouldn't fit in one of these kind of drawers in a bank safe deposit box, maybe your firm should have a safe or a vault that you keep it in and uh, so forth. If, it, if they entrust you with a vehicle or some large object like that, then you should have a secure storage garage where it's kept. And of course you can pass those costs through to the client. Now B is the record keeping requirement. Complete records of such account funds and other properties shall be kept uh, by the lawyer and shall be preserved for a period of, and I'm gonna say five years here, uh, that's the rule in most states, after termination of the representation. And so uh, make sure that you understand that there is a record keeping requirement. And if you keep sloppy records or you don't keep the records of your client funds, you could be subject to discipline, even if you are handling the funds properly uh, because you failed to comply with this part of uh, section A. B. A lawyer may deposit the lawyer's own funds in a client trust account for the sole purpose of paying bank service charges on that account, but only in an amount necessary for that purpose. And in the picture here, I have the lawyer kind of in the client's funds. And you have to keep exact records of how much of the money that is in your client fund account or client trust account at any given time is yours. And I want to explain this for my students in case you haven't opened a commercial bank account before. Um, when you have a law firm and you go to open a bank account for your client, you're going to have one bank account that's your firm's operating expenses, and that's going to be a commercial account. And usually those have a monthly or annual fee. This can be unfamiliar for people who haven't done it before because a lot of personal bank accounts, there, there's no fee, um, like a personal checking account, depending on the bank. Commercial accounts, like for a law firm, probably will. And your client trust account, depending on the bank, may also be subject to fees. Well, those fees aren't going to be taken out of your client's funds. Um, the, you're holding safeguarding those, so you're going to have to put your own money in. 
you're not allowed to keep enough money in there to just be a buffer for overdrafts, uh, potential overdrafts or things like that, like some people do with their personal account. And that's the only part that we had in this rule, only for the purpose of uh, covering bank charges, service charges on the account. So if you're a person who likes to keep an extra $100 or $500 in your personal checking account, in case you made an accounting error or something like that, uh, you and you're worried about overdraft charges on the account, you're not allowed to do that here. You are allowed to put in enough money to cover service charges. Most lawyers in practice are going to have this done as an automatic transfer from their firm's account um, to the other account when the charges apply, or will ask that have both accounts at the same bank and arrange with the bank that service charges on the client trust account will be withdrawn from the operating uh, funds of the law firm. Okay, so let's move on. Um, C says that a lawyer shall deposit into a client trust account legal fees and expenses that have been paid in advance to be withdrawn by the lawyer only as fees are earned or expenses incurred. So a lot of clients will give you money up front. A lot of lawyers ask for this if they're going to work on an hourly basis, um, or sometimes even if you work on a contingent fee basis, and you but you expect that there's going to be some fees and expenses that the client is going to be responsible for along the way. Um, and keep in mind that after at the end of the representation, you're going to have to give those funds back. We talked about that in our lectures about other rules. D says that upon receiving funds or other property in which a client or third person has an interest, a lawyer shall promptly notify the client or third person. And I have here a picture that's supposed to show that lawyers are trying to do a lot of things at once, right? So when most lawyers in practice are very busy, they're answering phone calls, looking things up, keeping track of things on their computer and are headed off to court all at the same time. And it's easy to just forget to let a client know that their check came in from the other party or the, the funds came in from the other party or to um, uh, notify uh, the third person that your client has given you the funds to turn over to them. So keep in mind that this needs to be done as soon as possible and um, uh, basically uh, excessive delays could mean that you're subject to discipline and hopefully you'll remember this for, as a potential test question as well. D continues, and D is a long uh, provision of the rule, a lawyer shall promptly deliver to the client or third person any funds or other property that the client or third person is entitled to receive, and upon request by the client or third person shall promptly render a full accounting regarding such property. Um, now, there's going to be in the next section, E is going to have an exception to this, um, and then another exception that the D says adds is if you have an agreement with the client or um, there's a law or court order requiring you not to turn over the funds for, uh, for whatever reason. We'll get to E in a moment, but keep in mind that the D has basically two prongs. One is as soon as the funds are available, you or you could have your support staff at the firm um, notify whoever the funds are supposed to be directed to, we've got your funds. Now, uh, keep in mind that sometimes there will be, the bank will make you wait a day or, uh, or two uh, business days before the funds can actually be withdrawn or dispersed. So communicate that to the client. And then as soon as the funds can be dispersed, they should. You don't get to just hang on to client funds for weeks or months at a time until you get around to it. Now, there's not a bright line rule about what counts as promptly, but there's some case law indicating that if you wait a few weeks, that's probably too long. So having said that, let's move on to E. Sometimes in the course of representation, a lawyer is in possession of property in which two or more persons, one of whom may be the lawyer, um, claim interests. And in that case, the property should, shall be kept separate by the lawyer until the dispute is resolved. Now, remember on our pre uh, previous rule, it said you turn over the funds to which the client or third party is entitled. If you are supposed to get to keep a portion of those funds to cover outstanding fees that you are owed, and it could be a contingent fee, or maybe you've worked some hours that you haven't withdrawn uh, to, uh, build a client for yet, um, you don't turn that over. You turn over what is um, going to be owed. And similarly, if 
the, there's funds that are owed to you. You shouldn't, you can't leave them in the client trust account indefinitely. Make sure you understand this. So if you have, if the client gave you $10,000 upfront for the representation um, and you've been working on the case, so you've billed a hundred hours, you need to withdraw that money from the client trust account um, uh, periodically and not just leave it in there indefinitely because at the point where you've earned that money, it becomes your money. And so now you have a problem that your funds are in the client trust account. So if you're billing the client on a weekly or monthly basis, tallying what your hours are so far, at that point, you should withdraw the funds from the account. Now, sometimes there's a dispute and it could be with you, right? The client may say, by the way, I wasn't satisfied with your services and I don't want to pay your fee. Um, sometimes there's other parties, uh, very commonly um, doctors. Uh, so the client has medical bills, they sue it, uh, the person who injured them, but the doctor or other parties already have a lien on those funds that they got um, separately in advance. And so, and then the client, of course, is going to say, don't pay my doctor, I should get those funds. And at that point, you have a problem, and that's what E covers. So anything that's not in dispute, you, you should distribute right away. So the lawyer shall promptly distribute all portions of the property as to which the interests are not in dispute. So let's say that your client um, dis disagrees with you about the percentage of your contingent fee, but they agree that you're owed at least X amount. So you're gonna take that amount out and give the client the amount that's not in dispute and then only hold the po part that there's not a dispute over. Or if you have someone, a third party that has a, a legitimate claim, it seems like that they are owed, let's say $10,000 of the client's funds. The client says, no, I think it's only $5,000. Well, you could give that person the $5,000, give the client their money, except for the remaining $5,000 that's in dispute and keep that in the account. The comment adds to this rule, a lawyer should not unilaterally assume to arbitrate a dispute between the client and the third party. But when there are substantial grounds for dispute as to the person entitled to the funds, the lawyer could file an action to ask a court to resolve it. In other words, if you realize that you are kind of caught in the middle between your client and some other people that have already secured a lien, a court order, on some or all of those funds, or there's a dispute between you and the client, you don't get to just decide the rule requires you to um, either let the parties sort it out or ask a file a court order and ask a judge to make the decision, beca right? Because it will seem unfair that you, you're, you have too much leverage, you're holding the funds and can make the decision. So um, about uh, you're gonna choose to disperse them or not. And so it seems like a little too much power if you are also the one uh, um, kind of, uh, deciding how to divvy things up. Okay, a few other notes from the comments that you could see worked into test questions. It is okay to have one combined client trust account. In other words, you have your firm's operating expense account and then you have one account that you put all your client funds in together. So keep in mind, you can mingle the funds of different clients as long as you keep accurate records. Um, as long as it's separate from your the lawyer's accounts or the firm's accounts. Um, on the other hand, there may be certain clients for whom you decide to go ahead and open a completely separate client trust account for that client. It might be necessary, for example, if you're administering a large complicated estate and it will just be easier to keep track of anything or some other sort of fiduciary relationship like that. Um, when it comes to uh, your record keeping, the comments say that you have to follow um, standard accounting and booking uh, uh, practice, bookkeeping practices don't get too creative with this. And so you have a duty to keep the records current and accurate. You should use generally accepted accounting practices and comply with any other record keeping rules established either by general law, like by statute or by court order. So sometimes a judge may um, say, I actually want you to track um, this type of activity on your client trust account or every disbursement or uh, when the money comes in. And obviously if there's a court order, you're gonna have to comply with that. I wanna take just a mo moment to talk about something that's not in the rules 
but you will encounter in practice, and they could ask about it on the MPRE because we have some Supreme Court cases about it. So most states have a program called IOLTA, which stands for Interest on Lawyers Trust Accounts. And basically, client trust accounts are not going to pay interest, in case you've been wondering who gets the interest on the money that's sitting in that account. And the answer is not you and not the client. Um, that money is going to be uh, usually taken under an IOLTA program, or at least part of it, um, that would normally accrue to each client trust account. And basically, it gets turned over to the bar or some entity set up by the bar, which then in turn disperses it to legal aid clinics and law school clinics as grants. And so we use this, I, the interest on the accounts in the aggregate. And if you think about it, uh, the way this works is, let's say you have a, um, a client trust account and you're doing a residential real estate closing and the, the value of the home was $250,000. Well, that's fine. And in the process of that, $250,000 gets put in your client trust account, either uh, um, on its way to your client or it's on the way from the client. Well, it's only going to be there for a few days and the interest that that's go going to earn in a day or two is going to be minuscule, a, a, cent, a penny or a few pennies, really not worth tracking. But statewide in the aggregate, there's hundreds of millions of dollars in all the lawyers' trust accounts. And so overall, over the course of a year, the interest would add up and will count as several million dollars that could be dispersed to the different legal aid clinics and law school clinics in the state to provide legal representation for indigent individuals. Again, this really kind of got started and became popular in the 80s and 90s. Um, and it has been challenged. It was challenged as a taking under a, an unconstitutional taking in, uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. And here's the pair of decisions. I'm not going to bore you with all the facts of the case, but you just should know the Supreme Court held in the first case in 1998 that IOLTA is in fact a taking of a client's property, that interest um, under the uh, takings clause of the US constitution. They remanded the case and when the remand came up again on appeal, um, they held that clients are not entitled to any compensation for that taking because the clients suffered no net loss. In other words, there was a taking and, the, and they are owed compensation of zero. And that's how the court resolved this. And that's all you really need to know about IOLTA for the MPRE. And that concludes our lecture about ABA Model Rule 1.15.